In researching biomagnetics the past few months, uh, going back into the history, this book, Vibrational Medicine, by Dr. Richard Gerber, has uh, shown me the history in a way that I can't find anywhere else. So I'm going to read from this. Uh, and this is an excerpt from the book here. Psychic healing as an aspect of human potential, an historical look at its evolution through the ages. The use of laying on hands to heal human illnesses dates back thousands of years in human history. Evidence for its use in Egypt is found in the Ebers Papyrus dated back to 1552 BC. This document describes the use of laying on hands healing for medical treatment. For centuries before the birth of Christ, the, Greek, the Greeks used therapeutic touch therapy and their Asclepian temples for healing the sick. The writings of Aristophanes detail the use of laying on hands in Athens to restore a blind man's sight and return fertility to a barren woman. The Bible has many references to laying on of the hands for both the medical and spiritual applications. It's well known that many of the miraculous healings of Jesus were done by the laying of hands. Jesus said, quote, These things that I do, so can ye do and more. Laying on the hands of healing was considered part of the work of the early Christian ministry as much as preaching and administering the sacraments. In the early Christian church, laying on hands was combined with the sacramental use of holy water and oil. Over the following hundreds of years, the healing ministry of the church began to gradually decline. In Europe, the healing ministry was carried on as the royal touch. Kings of several European countries were purportedly successful in curing diseases such as TB by laying of hands. In England, this method of healing began with Edward the Confessor and lasted for seven centuries and ended with the reign of the skeptical William IV. Many of the early attempts at laying on of the hands healing seem to be predicated upon a belief either in the powers of Jesus or the king or a particular healer. There were other contemporary medical theorists who felt the special vital forces and influences nature were the mediators of these healing effects. A number of early researchers into the mechanisms of healing theorized on the likely magnetic nature of the energies involved. One of the earliest proponents of a magnetic vital force of nature was the controversial ph physician all the, known as Paracelsus from 1493 to 1541. Now remember the ages of Columbus 1492, it's all coming around at the exact same time. In addition to these discoveries of the new drug therapies, Paracelsus founded the sympathetic system of medicine according to which the stars and other bodies, especially magnets, influenced humans by means of a subtle emanation of fluid that pervaded all space. His theory was an attempt to explain the apparent link between human beings and the stars and other heavenly bodies. This is also why astrology works. It's their energy beings. The, the stars are called luminaries. The ancient called them luminaries because they were light beings. Paracelsus' sympathetic system may be viewed as an early astrological insight into the influences of the planets and the stars of human illness and behavior. Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, would never, never diagnose a patient without looking at his astrological chart first. Western medicine has completely lost this connection to the heavens and healing. The proposed link between humans and the heavens above was thought this was through a subtle pervasive fluid, perhaps an early construct of the, quote, ether which existed, exists throughout the universe. He attributed magnetic qualities to the sub subtle substance and felt that it was possessed unique qualities of healing. He also concluded that if this force was possessed or wielded by someone, then that person could arrest or heal diseases in others. Paracelsus stated that the vital force was not enclosed inside an individual, but radiated within and around him or her like a luminous sphere which could be made to act at a distance. Considering the accuracy of this description of the energy surrounding people, one wonders whether or not Paracelsus could clairvoyantly observe the human auric field. This gets into Karelian photography, which the Russian Karelian developed to show our auras. He could photo, they could photograph it now, also in plants, also in animals. After Paracelsus' death, the magnetic tradition was carried on by Robert Flood, a physician and mystic. Flood was considered to be one of the most prominent alchemical theorists of the early 17th century. He emphasized the role of the sun in health as a source of light and life. 
What are we having now? Vitamin D deficiency because everybody's indoors in their glass homes, driving in their glass cars, working in their glass offices, and the sun is not what it used to be. The sun was considered the purveyor of life beams required for all living creatures on earth. Uh, one is reminded of the Indian concept of prana, the subtle energy within sunlight, which is assimilated through the process of breathing. In 1778, a radical healer stepped forward to say that he could achieve remarkable therapeutic success without the need for patients' faith or belief in the healing powers of Jesus or himself. Franz Anton Mesmer claimed that the healing results which he obtained came through the enlightened use of a universal energy which he called fluidum. Mesmer claimed that fluidum was a subtle physical fluid that filled the universe and was the connecting medium between people and other living things and between living organisms, the earth, and the heavenly bodies. This theory is quite similar to Paracelsus' astrological concept of sympathetic medicine. Mesmer suggested that all things in nature possessed a particular power which manifested itself through special actions upon other bodies. He felt that all physical bodies, animals, plants, and even stones were impregnated with this magical fluid. In fact, the ancients used lodestones, which are magnetic. During his early medical research in Vienna, Mesmer discovered that placing a magnet over areas of the body afflicted with disease would often affect a cure. Experiments with patients who had nervous disorders often produced unusual motor effects. He noted that successful magnet treatments for frequently induced pronounced muscle spasms and jerks. He came to believe that magnets he used for therapy were mainly conductors of an ethereal fluid which issued forth his own which issued forth from his own body to create subtle healing effects in patients. He considered this vital force or fluid to be of a magnetic nature, referring to it as quote animal magnetism, to distinguish it from mineral or ferromagnetism. Through his research, Mesmer came to believe that this subtle energetic fluid was somehow associated with the nervous system, especially when his treatments would often cause involuntary muscle spasms and tremors. He hypothesized that the nerve and body fluids conveyed the fluid fluidum to all areas of the body where it animated and revitalized those parts. Mesmer's concept of fluidum is reminiscent of the ancient Chinese theory of qi energy which flows through the meridians, feeding the vital force to the nerves and tissues of the body. Mesmer realized that the life-sustaining and regulating actions of the magnetic fluidum were integral to the basic process of homeostasis and health. When the individual was in a state of health, he or she was considered to be in harmony with these basic laws of nature as expressed by a proper interplay of the vital magnetic forces. If disharmony occurred between the physical body and the subtle forces of nature, sickness was the end result. Mesmer later realized that the best source of this universal force was the human body itself. He felt that the most active points of energetic flow were the palms of the hands. By placing the practitioner's hands on patients for direct healing, energy was allowed a direct route to flow from the healer to the patient. Because of Mesmer's influence through this revolutionary period in French history, the technique of laying on hands, otherwise known as, quote, magnetic passes, end quote, became quite popular. Unfortunately, many scientific observers at the time considered mesmerism to be clearly an act of hypnosis and suggestion. To this day, many scientists still refer to hypnosis as mesmerism. This is the origin of the term mesmerized. Bet you didn't know that. In 1784, the King of France appointed a commission of inquiry into the validity of Mesmer's experiments in healing. Among the commission were members of the Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Medicine, the Royal Society, as well as the American statesman scientist Benjamin Franklin. The experiments which they devised were constructed to test the presence or the absence of the magnetic fluidum, which Mesmer claimed was the healing force behind his therapeutic successes. Unfortunately, none of the tests devised by the commission were concerned with the measurement of fluidum's medical effects. You don't test what you don't want to find. The conclusion of this prestigious commission was that fluidum did not exist. Surprise, surprise. Although they did not deny Mesmer's therapeutic success with patients, they felt that the medical effects which Mesmer produced were due to the sensitive excitement, imagination, and imitation of other patients, a.k.a. the placebo effect. 
anything to do, nothing to do with magnets. Interestingly, a committee of the medical section of the Academy Academy de Sciences examined animal magnetism again in 1831 and accepted Mesmer's viewpoint. However, despite this validation, Mesmer's work never achieved widespread recognition. As more recent laboratory investigations into the physiological effects of the laying on hands have confirmed the magnetic nature of these subtle healing energies, researchers have demonstrated that Mesner's understanding of the magnetic nature of the subtle energies of the human body was centuries ahead of his contemporaries. As will be shown, direct measurement of these energies by controversial tools of electromagnetic detection are as difficult today as during Mesmer's time. Mesmer also discovered that water could be charged with a subtle magnetic force and that stored energy from bottles of healer-treated water could be transmitted to sick patients by way of a metallic iron rod which patients would hold in their hands. The storage device which is used to relay healing energy from the charged water to patients was known as the baquette. Uh, Although today many consider Mesmer to have been a great hypnotist, there are few who really understand the pioneering nature of his research into the subtle magnetic energies of healing. And just a quick sidebar on water, Dr. Robert Miller of Atlanta, Georgia, research chemist has studied the biological effects of healers. Miller has been able to experimentally confirm Dr. Grad's discovery of healers' ability to disrupt hydrogen bonding in water. He found significantly similarity between the energetic fields of magnetic fields and the field effects noted with the psychic healers. So getting down to here. Miller discovered that metallic stirring rods placed in contact with energized water would provide a route for the healing energy to flow in a specific direction. This discovery confirms the rationale behind the bouquet that Mesmer used for treating patients nearly 200 years ago. Dr. Miller found a number of interesting similarities between magnet-treated and healer-treated water. He created a unique experiment. Uh, he placed a solution of supersaturated copper sulfate in a magnetic field at 4,500 Gauss. Gauss is the Tesla measurement for magnets for 15 minutes. When the crystals eventually formed, Miller noted they were of the turquoise blue variety noted in the healer treated solutions instead of the usual jade green. Uh, the experiment to measure further s physiological similarities between the effects of magnet-treated and healer-treated water. He selected three groups of seeds, each composed of 25 rye seeds. Uh, at the end of four days, he looked to see how many of the 25 rye seeds in each group had sprouted. Dr. Miller found that the seeds which had been watered with regular tap water had an 8% germination rate, whereas seeds watered with the healer-treated water showed a 36% germination rate or a fourfold increase in the number of new sprouts. Now if you're having to live off the lands and food's important, do you think this is important information folks? But even more surprising was Miller's discovery that seeds which had been watered with magnetic treated water showed more than an eightfold increase or 68 percent rate of seedling germination. So again, to follow up a little bit more on this, uh, Dr. Krieger looks at healers and hemoglobin, the evolution of therapeutic touch. Uh, Dr. Krieger, now professor of nursing at New York University, was particularly fascinated by Grad's observation that plants watered with healer-treated water showed an increase in the amount of chlorophyll present in their leaves. Krieger wished to examine and confirm the effects of healers on humans in an analytical method which would separate the influence of belief. The experimental work of Grad and Smith had convinced her that true energy effects occur between patient and healer even when the patient is only a sick plant or a wounded mouse or even a damaged enzyme. She wished to extrapolate the known information from studies of healing in non-human systems toward an experiment which would for confirm the healing energy uh, influence in humans. In 1971, shortly after his work with Dr. Grad, Mr. Estebani, a healer used in Grad studies, was asked to participate in just a, as an experiment. The research was conducted by a medical doctor and a clairvoyant who were studying the healing process. Krieger joined the group as a fellow researcher, offering her skills as a healthcare practitioner. The study was conducted on a farm in the foothills of Berkshire Mounds in New York, utilizing as subjects a large group of medically referred patients with various illnesses. I'll get down to the results here. 
Krieger measured hemoglobin levels in both groups of patients before and after a series of healing treatments to the experimental group. Similar, similar, similar to, to electricity, some healers, as mentioned previously, have referred to healing energy as para-electricity. Nurses who had taken Krieger's course slowly became proficient in the doing laying on hands of healing. Krieger herself found that the more she worked with it, the more effective a healer she became. Healing seemed to be a kind of subtle energetic gymnastics exercise. The more time and work an individual would put in, the better at healing they became. This relatively small group of nurses whom Krieger had trained began to practice their healing of some of their hospital patients. Although some felt they were a bit strange, patients did appear to get better faster when therapeutic touch was added to the regimen of therapy. They also worked their healing ministrations on anyone that would be willing to try an experiment. This would occasionally include sick and wounded stray dogs and cats with whom certain nurses achieved remarkable results. After observing some of the results obtained by the healer nurse or trainees, Krager became firmly convinced that non-psychic individuals could be taught to do the healing. She concluded that therapeutic was much a natural human potential which could be demonstrated by individuals who had a fairly healthy body. In addition, these qualities the potential healer had to be educable because though therapeutic touch might seem like a simple act, she found that in reality it was a quite complex to do in a conscious manner. Krieger's study utilized registered nurses who were under her direction in hospitals and other health facilities in the metropolitan New York area. She studied 32 registered nurses and 64 patients designed similar to her two previous research projects. Uh, 60, 64 sick patients were divided into two groups, 32 each. The control group had a regular medical and nursing care under the direction of 16 non-healers. The experimental group of patients had similar care except that 16 Krager trained nurses performed therapeutic touch in addition to their regular medical care. Hemoglobin levels were measured in both groups. The two groups were compared for differences. In the nurse healer treated group there were statistically significant increases in hemoglobin. Her statistical analysis showed that the odds against the results obtained due to chance were less than one in a thousand. Now this is in the new book the third edition but it's not in this uh, link here so I'm gonna have to read from it. Krieger's study was repeated in 1973 with a larger group of patients and even stricter controls to answer criticisms directed toward the design of her study. 46 patients an experimental group and 33 ill patients in her control group. Again she achieved similar data. The tendency for healing energy to increase hemoglobin has been found to be so strong that cancer patients who have undergone laying on hands healing have occasionally shown rises in hemoglobin levels in spite of treatment with bone marrow suppressive agents which would predictably, predictably induce anemias. Many unique applications have come from the use of this healing art in the hospital setting. In one preemie unit in New York, nurses began to use therapeutic touch on premature infants as part of their medical care. The medical staff began to note such tremendous strides in infant progress and weight gain that they sheepishly asked the nurses what they were doing that was different from the usual regime. Eventually, all doctors and nurses in the neonatal unit were taught to use therapeutic touch on the infants, including many inquisitive parents who wished to give their children every possible chance for a healthy survival. In another hospital in New York, doctors and nurses in the emergency room began to use therapeutic touch to ease and quiet many of their patients coming in and out of psychedelic drug overdoses. Utilization of this technique has met with interesting success.